Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast. On this episode, I will discuss congenital cardiac malformations, which is a topic that has been requested by several listeners, which is completely understandable because cardiac radiology in general and congenital cardiac malformations in particular are very high yield for ABR board exams. I expect that this will be either a two- or three-part series covering congenital cardiac malformations, After all of the episodes on this topic have been released, I will make a free downloadable study guide on this topic available on my website, theradiologyreview.com. Without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question, what are key imaging features to identify the right atrium in a congenital cardiac malformation? Potentially, the best imaging feature to identify the right atrium is identification of the specific atrium into which the coronary sinus drains. Additional features suggesting the right atrium is to identify which atrium the suprahepatic inferior vena cava drains into, and that is a pretty reliable indicator that that is the right atrium. The superior vena cava insertion, on the other hand, can be more variable and less reliable to identify the true right atrium. Next related question, what are key imaging features to identify the left atrium in a congenital cardiac malformation? The left atrium is best identified by searching for the atrium which has the finger-like atrial appendage. Pulmonary vein insertion is less reliable to identify the true left atrium. Next, what are key imaging features to identify the right ventricle in a congenital cardiac malformation case? Key features that can help identify the right ventricle include presence of the moderator band, identification of a more apical attachment of the atrioventricular valve, presence of the infundibulum, as well as a more trabeculated appearance of the septum compared to a smoother septum on the left ventricular side. Next, what are key imaging features of tetralogy of Fallot? Tetralogy of Fallot is a really high-yield entity that you absolutely need to have down when you take radiology board exams. Tetralogy of Fallot is the result of failure of the right ventricular outflow track to fuse with the interventricular septum. On radiography, look for decreased pulmonary blood flow and a boot-shaped heart with an upturned cardiac apex and possible right aortic arch. The four classic features of Tetralogy of Fallot are, first, in no particular order, right ventricular hypertrophy, and that is a feature that is often a manifestation slightly later in disease. It can take some time for the right ventricular hypertrophy to develop, but it is one of the four key features. Second, a ventricular septal defect. Third, pulmonary stenosis and four, an overriding aorta. Next question, what is the prognosis in terms of survival for individuals with Tetralogy of Fallot following appropriate surgical repair? In general, the prognosis is excellent. Following surgical repair, there is at least a 90% survival at 35 years following surgery. Note that the degree of right ventricular outflow tract stenosis may guide the timing of surgical repair, as well as the degree of clinical symptoms and timing of symptom onset. Severe stenosis generally requires earlier surgical repair. 
Next question. What is the most common type of atrial septal defect? Osteum primum or osteum secundum? The answer is that osteum secundum accounts for around 60% of atrial septal defects compared to osteum primum, which accounts for something like 35% of atrial septal defects. The final 5% is from sinus venosus atrial septal defects. So in this case, the name is reversed in terms of commonality, meaning that osteum secundum is actually the first most common, and osteum primum is actually the second most common. Classic associations with atrial septal defects to remember for board exams include osteum primum, which is associated with an endocardial cushion defect, which is common in trisomy 21, also known as Down syndrome. Osteum secundum has a common association with holt oram syndrome, that is spelled H-O-L-T-O-R-A-M, and holt oram syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition with congenital heart defects like an atrial septal defect and ventricular septal defect, as well as coarctation of the aorta and upper limb anomalies like radial and thumb aplasia and hypoplasia of the clavicle. Finally, sinus venosus atrial septal defect has an association with partially anomalous pulmonary venous return. Next question. What are the components of the endocardial cushion? The endocardial cushion results from formation of the lower atrial septum, ventricular septum, and the septal leaflets of the tricuspid and mitral valves. Next, what is the difference between a partial, transitional, and complete endocardial cushion defect. A partial endocardial cushion defect has a canal passing through either the mitral or tricuspid valves, but not both, and may be clinically asymptomatic. A transitional endocardial cushion defect has a canal through both the mitral and tricuspid valves, and the atrial and or ventricular septum. A complete endocardial cushion defect has a large septal defect and may have either a common or separate mitral valve and tricuspid valve. A complete endocardial cushion defect will have symptoms of congestive heart failure and a large left-to-right shunt as well as mitral regurgitation. Note that all of these will have an osteum primum atrial septal defect. Nearly half of all individuals with an endocardial cushion defect will have Down syndrome. On imaging, expect diffuse cardiac enlargement, a gooseneck deformity of the left ventricular alpha tract on angiography, as well as right greater than left increased pulmonary vascularity. If you see additional findings of a hypersegmentum sternum and 11 ribs, that would be a clue that there is coexistent trisomy 21. Next question. What are common imaging findings suggestive of an atrial septal defect? Atrial septal defects without other associated cardiac anomalies would manifest with enlargement of the right atrium and right ventricle with a normal appearing left atrium and left ventricle. You would also expect to see associated asymmetric right pulmonary artery enlargement. Next, what is core triatriatum? I may have not said that right. Honestly, I'm not sure. That is C-O-R, core, Triatriatum, T R I A T R I A T U M. As the name does suggest, 
with triatriatum. This is an entity in which there are essentially three instead of the normal two atria due to a congenital anomaly in which a membrane divides the left atrium into an anterior and posterior chamber. Therefore, it is as if you have three atria, one on the right and two on the left. Clinical symptoms are often those of pulmonary hypertension in children, and core triatriatum can be fatal. This appears similar to mitral stenosis on imaging with a normal-sized heart and pulmonary edema, at least on radiography. There may be an associated atrial septal defect and anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. Early surgical intervention, as with many of these congenital cardiac anomalies, will lead to the best outcome. Next, what is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease? The most common cyanotic congenital heart condition is Tetralogy of Fallot. Next, what is the so-called pentology of Fallot? Pentology of Fallot has the four findings characteristic of Tetralogy of Fallot, which to review are ventricular septal defect, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, overriding aorta, and right ventricular hypertrophy, in addition to findings of atrial septal defects or patent ductus arteriosus. Therefore, that would make the four findings of Tetralogy of Fallot plus either atrial septal defect or patent ductus arteriosus, the pentology of Fallot. Next question, true or false? Tetralogy of Fallot is associated with a right-sided aortic arch in greater than 50% of cases. The answer here is false. A right-sided aortic arch is associated with Tetralogy of Fallot, but is seen in approximately 25% of cases. Next, what are some of the most common causes of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction in cases of Tetralogy of Fallot? With Tetralogy of Fallot, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction can result from various causes, including valvular anomalies such as a hypoplastic pulmonary valve annulus or a bicuspid pulmonary valve. Other contributors to right ventricular outflow tract obstruction can include infundibular stenosis and pulmonary artery hypoplasia. Next, Tetralogy of Fallot, along with many other congenital cardiac anomalies, have vactoral associations. What are the principal components of vactoral, and that is spelled V-A-C-T-E-R-L? Vactoral associations are high yield on the ABR core exam, and I have already reviewed this on at least one other episode, and will likely review this on future episodes because these come up with some frequency. The V in vactoral stands for vertebral anomalies of various sorts. The A stands for anorectal anomalies such as anal atresia. C cardiac anomalies and cleft lip, TE, tracheoesophageal atresia and or esophageal atresia, R, renal anomalies and or radial ray anomalies, and L, limb anomalies such as polydactyly. Next, what congenital cardiac anomalies are commonly associated with congenital rubella infection? Congenital infections are high-yield entities and are perhaps deserving of their own episode, but for now let's talk about cardiac manifestations of congenital rubella infection. Congenital rubella infection is associated with both ventricular septal defects 
as well as Tetralogy of Fallot. Additional features of congenital rubella infection can include things like deafness, intrauterine growth restriction, mental impairment, and microcephaly. Rubella is one of the TORCH infections, T-O-R-C-H, which stands for toxoplasmosis, O for other, which commonly includes syphilis, varicella zoster, and parvovirus B19, R for rubella, C for cytomegalovirus, and H for herpes simplex virus. And with congenital rubella, the risk to the developing infant is much higher if the mother is experiencing a primary rubella infection rather than a reinfection of rubella or reactivation. Next, which trisomies are classically associated with congenital cardiac anomalies? There may be others that could be included on this list, but for the purposes of board study, I would remember at least these three trisomies in terms of having a strong association with congenital cardiac anomalies, and these are trisomy 13, trisomy 18, and trisomy 21. All three of those trisomies, trisomy 13, 18, and 21, are high yield for ABR core exams, so go ahead and look up the details on those if you are unfamiliar. Note that nearly every case of trisomy 13 and 18 will have a congenital cardiac anomaly, and roughly half of trisomy 21 will have an associated congenital cardiac anomaly. Last question for this episode. Name some cardiovascular anomalies associated with Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is notably associated with a bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of the aorta and risk of aortic dissection. That is enough for now. I will continue the discussion of congenital cardiac anomalies on the next episode. I hope this information is helpful for many of you. Again, after all of the episodes on congenital cardiac anomalies have been released, I will make a free downloadable study guide on this topic available that you can access at theradiologyreview.com. If you haven't been to theradiologyreview.com, I encourage you to check that out. There are many study guides, access to podcast episodes, other free resources, and the Radiology Review Journal, which has some interesting articles that may be of interest to you. Keep up the good work and study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams, so prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.